Uh, at this point, I really would like to open it up to the audience. This is your opportunity to ask Richard or, and or John whatever question that you think is appropriate. But the key is, I would like it to be a question and not a statement. Any? Okay. We will walk around. With question over here. A question over there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to wait? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to ask, should we have a, a, a tier six? Because we've had, we had a tier one and added a tier two for a reason, et cetera. We're talking about pension. Pension, right. And should that, and, and in doing so, would that not um, free up money to be used for other services, like right. salaries? Right. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Peter Murphy? Peter, and who, is it the question to both of them? or Yes, one either one. Could. Okay. Uh, there always should be continued review of the pension system. Uh, <laughs> there should be a tier six if it's the right thing to do. There should not be a tier six if it's the wrong thing to do. So, I mean, <laughs> but and, and and those discussions ought to go on. But if the fundamental social basis of a tier six is to reduce the pension levels, go to let's say defined contribution right. in, in, to some extent, so that instead of getting thirty thousand dollars a year, that New York State retirees would end up with an average pension of $26,000. Well, I think we need to think about the economic consequences of that. I will not surrender this debate to an assumption that pensions are excessive and are the cause of the state's fiscal problems. They're not. But nothing should be uh, uh, immune from examination and change. Well, I think given the... Um if you, if you look at how the system is currently funded, you'll see that by the way in which the traditional accounting is done for governments, it's 100% funded. But if you, if you account, did the accounting, and we're moving in this direction, where the public systems are going to be based, <coughs> or the analysis of, of their funding level is going to be based upon how it's done in the private sector, then you'll find that even New York's system is not 100% funded. Um, I think that going forward, it's going to be I think we have to take the long view here. If you had a, a, a new tier, that's not going to marginally or massively affect your finances over the next uh, five to 10 years. It will, over the course of 15 to 20 years to 30 years, chart, start to change some of that, as President Obama said in another context, and this one would be true, bending the cost curve. because. The key is, it seems to me, we have to move to a, either a defined contribution system for new workers or a hybrid system, which would be defined contribution and defined benefit. And uh, I think that there is a, there's a, the, a lot of approaches that would work well for people. Uh, for instance, if you had a more of a defined contribution system, people wouldn't feel constrained that they had to stay in public employment. They could own their, their benefit and take it with them. There's a very successful experience already here in, in the state that uh, the SUNY and CUNY professors use through Tia Kref and MetLife and other insurers where they, there are annuities that are the basis of their pension. This has worked extraordinarily well since the mid-60s. And there's no reason why it couldn't work for many uh, state workers as well going in the future. But pension reform, again, is something that we have to look at this. How do you change the cost curve in New York State over the long term? I remember 1980 like it was yesterday, 31 years ago. And you know, a lot of you are still going to be in the workforce or thing nearing retirement 31 years from now. Richard and I probably won't be, although we might still be debating. But the question is, how do, you, how do you make New York so that it is more economically competitive with comparable states in terms of its costs? And by every measure, our costs and our expenditures are out of line with virtually every other state. That's what we've got to do if we're going to resuscitate the private sector economy and bring places like Buffalo and Elmira back to life. I think there was a question over there. And there's one... Uh, this is addressed to Mr. Brodsky. Uh, you say you should look at assumptions and not forget about assumptions. You make that assumption that the unions have very smart people on their side and management, the political back side, has very smart people. And that's true. But those managers report to their political leaders 
and their political leaders know there's a big payoff to helping unions and sticking it to the taxpayer because benefits are concentrated and costs are dispersed. I thought you didn't want statements. Yeah, what's the question? Is there a specific question? Yeah, okay, explain to us how you can say that the management is looking out for the taxpayer. Well, I'm not quite <laughs> as cynical as you are, but that probably is a pretty high fence to jump over. The, 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 the notion that unions control the politics of the state, which is at the heart of what your, I think your concern is, I don't think is, um, at least it's not true in my experience. They have enormous weight, including the public sector unions, so do the private sector unions, but the last time I looked, the big money in this state isn't coming to elected officials from labor. It's coming from wealthy people in the private sector, for better or worse. So uh, I guess I, I see no basis for the assumption that the political process is itself and so corrupted by labor that you cannot get a management team out there that will do the right thing by taxpayers. Okay. Question over here. And then there's another question in the back as well. This is for both of you, but especially for John. Um, Hi, Paul. I was wondering if, um, since both of you were in the legislature for over 20 years, and both of you practiced law while you were in the legislature, like those MTA track workers that only worked 20 hours a week and got 40 hours pay, full-time pensions, and full-time health, would you be opposed to legislators having any outside income while they serve as legislators? Who wants to take um, that first? <clears throat> you no, know, I, I, I think that, well, number one, it is, it would, we'd be better with a more part-time legislature rather than a more full-time legislature. And I think that having legislators with outside uh, economic endeavors keeps their feet grounded in the real world. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, for instance, there should be full disclosure of outside income. So I think that there's, you know, I've gone back and forth in my mind through the years about this, and I, I think it's a pertinent question, it's a very good one. I don't pretend to have the real answer, but my, my view would be the legislature should be more part-time and less full-time, and but there should be full disclosure of outside income. How about benefits? Would they receive full health no. and full pension? No, in fact, I would, I would, in fact, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, uh, uh, Assemblyman Mike Fitzpatrick has proposed a bill that says that the legislators cannot be in a the uh, pension system, that they have to be in a defined uh, contribution system. And I think that would be very appropriate. Because they have there's an inherent con let's face it, in the eight, 16 years I was in the legislature, the easiest bill to vote for was a, a, a pension enhancement. And they come up every year, and usually they come up in the dead of night, and I voted against an awful lot of them, and there was one big one I voted for that I regret, and that was the 2000 bill. Uh, but the, the fact is, is that uh, uh, those bills are very poorly understood, and we saw the kind of scandal where uh, some of the actuarial analysis on some of the New York City bills a few years ago were being drafted by people that were paid by the union to, to promote the, the legislation. And that was certainly uh, uh, eyebrow raising. That ha that was after I left the legislature. But I do think that it would be it would be much better for the legislature not to be voting on a pension system that they themselves are members of, because I think there's an inherent conflict there. Richard, I think they're not. This question I was taking two parts. The first question is whether the legislature should be full time or part time, and the second question is if it's part time. Should the legislature receive, what type of benefits, if any, they should receive? I, 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 given the size of the task and the fundamental uh, virtues of the legislative process in a democracy, I don't think it's possible to have a part-time legislature running a $150 billion corporation. I just, I, I, it just won't work. What's implicit in this is this, again, right-wing attack on legislative bodies. The term limits, uh, 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 the the general notion that the legislature is essentially corrupt or the executive branch isn't. You know, they took out and chains about a third of the governors in the tri-state tri area in the last 10 years, and, and, and no one ever says that the executive branch is inherently corrupt. Uh, the, 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 so the, the real question underlying this is, what do you want the legislature to do?
and do you really want it to do it? And then you go to questions of compensation and uh, benefits. If lowering compensation will get you a more effective legislative presence, then we should do that. I doubt that's going to be the outcome. And I think what this is is a general uh, attack on the ability of the legislature to control governors. That there is an authoritarian strain in John's presentation, and even in the Paul's question, uh, which is that let the governor do it. Let the governor set the labor standards. Let the governor decide who gets paid what. Let the governor decide what the policies are. And the legislature will come in on a part-time basis and say, me too. Do you remember the Rockefeller years? For those of you who might, with all due respect to our hosts, <laughs> everybody said it was a good... Remember when three men in the room were Stanley Fink, Warren Anderson, and you, Carrie? The, le the legislature is much abused in the state wrongly. And attacking the compensation issues can be done on an intellectually honest basis. I certainly think it's a subject of discussion. But it also can be a, a mask for an attack on the ability of uh, 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 the legislature to function. This budget is being driven by a constitutional arrangement on the powers of the legislature in which the governor is saying, if you don't vote my budget in by the end of the month, I will, through the process of extenders, set the policies of the state, or else you have to shut down the government. That's in nobody's interest. And this co compensation question arises in that <laughs> There is a question in the back, and there's a question here. Uh, my question is for Assemblyman Brodsky. Um, I'm a professional engineer. I have two degrees from RPI. One of the topics that we covered in our ethics training was a constraint on our right to uh, collectively organize or strike uh, on the grounds that our first obligation as professionals was to the public. Um, doctors have the same professional obligation. And what I want to know is how you can simultaneously say that doctors have a moral right not to strike and simultaneously say that public employees have an almost, you know, have an almost obligation to strike when both claim to serve the public. I, I, I don't think I said that, but I understand the question. As to who in American society should have the right to strike, um, it, it is, the doctors do it as a basis of almost personal, professional standards. I know of no law that says doctors can't strike if those circumstances came up. I prefer democracy in the workplace to authoritarianism in the workplace as a means of resolving difficult economic and political questions. Um, so if doctors want to organize, and they have in, in, in some of the hospitals, and the society wants to either allow them to strike or not, we can have that debate. But if you forbid them to strike, you have to have a mechanism for resolving the fundamental questions that concern them that are not uh, merely do what the government tells you to do. This, uh, yeah, if I could just add, I, I, I really think this, uh, where Richard and I fundamentally disagree, is that, uh, and I certainly disagree with his characterization of my view as an authoritarian view, I think I've been quite clear in saying that the system has become so hidebound, so procedure-driven, so difficult and cumbersome, both in our civil service laws and in our collective bargaining rules, that it's almost impossible to manage efficiently uh, at the governmental level. And we see this time and again. The Islip Town Supervisor was elected in 2009, a Democrat. He came in, he had a fiscal problem, they had 300 employees that were able to take town vehicles home at night. He wanted to, to say, you know, 100 of you or so can't do it. No, went to her, he lost. That was a term and condition of employment uh, as it had evolved. You have other situations where um, things become uh, decided as a union right or privilege when then it's not even, it's a custom or practice, it's not even decided by the, the mayor or the chief executive uh, or the chief negotiator for the city, but these things become enshrined. Our system has gotten so difficult, and this is a perfect example. I, you didn't say anything about this uh, on the 3020A. I mean, there's no incentive for the teachers union to settle these cases. They have no stake. They don't pay a nickel for the 3020A proceeding. 
And what happens, you talk to any arbitrator, what happens is that you'll go through a day of hearings, and then there'll be an additional time necessary, and they look at their calendars and say, okay, two months, three months from then, and there's no incentive for the union to settle it, to get it over with, to conclude it, because they don't pay a nickel, their person is getting home, is paid sitting at home, in the home version of the rubber room, and the chief school district has to pay that salary and benefits, and then they have to pay for a substitute. John, will you This concede, is the system we have today. John, will you concede that Mayor Bloomberg and the Teachers Union of the City of New York found a way to negotiate a better system? Yeah, I, I think I think no that they much. did only <laughs> after only after massive embarrassment. But the fact is, the 3028 procedure is inflicted upon school districts all over this state, and the union basically their attitude is. Hey, give us something in order to get that. I, I, you gotta, you gotta buy, buy them off I'm, to get a reasonable reform. Not and we're at a point in this state where we can't do it anymore. Not, Taxpayers cannot give. I'm not anymore. defending or attacking 3028. It's a subject for another d d discussion. Well, do you agree with my my point well, on 3028? Let me say what I'm going to say, and then I'll answer okay. the question. The, the the what I said was that the process for reform, which worked, involved bargaining, and it did. And it can work again in other places in the same way. And since the Senate before the House this morning is the process of bargaining as a way to solve these problems, I just point out that your own example was resolved by my process. Do I think 3028 works? No, I don't. I think we have another question here. Good morning. My name is Alexander Mokman. I have a question uh, which actually follows nicely from these last comments that deals with incentives. It's a question from Mr. Richard Bradsky, but uh, I'd be interested to hear a response from both of you. Um, you phrased a lot of your comments of, uh, in terms of values as opposed to economic issues and numbers, uh, which I think is important. But I think as a society, both as a nation and a state, uh, we, we're a meritocracy and we value um, uh, working, for, uh, working hard and, and uh, earning what you work for. I'm interested to know how you think that value fits into this equation um, and how we incentivize uh, these obviously important services that are demanded of, of uh, public workers, uh, the largest being teachers, um, how do we incentivize uh, improved performance? Thank you. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful question. And it's a wonderful question because uh, it is clearly a value that I would place within the equation of things that we have to sort out. And it's very hard to do in the government context. I would point out to you that most people who enter uh, teaching, for example, do so not because their primary goal in life is to make money. <coughs> and that teachers, by uh, the, the fact that the teachers are evidence that they are incentivized to serve the society. <coughs> the question is, what level of compensation uh, do you need to provide? And would, if you increase the level of compensation, would you get better teachers? When you listen to Wall Street, they can't touch bonuses. Because if we don't pay these bonuses, we won't get good people in. When it comes to these guys talking about Wall Street, uh, about teachers, well, we're paying them too much. You know, if you believe in incentives on Wall Street, you better believe in them in the classroom. So I would say to you that the way in which these incentives can be uh, compromised <coughs> is through collective bargaining but that it is a troubling and difficult theoretical question that I don't think any of us have an exact answer to. I, I'm going to follow up only because uh, I think you're <coughs> raising a very good point. And Richard, it, it strikes me that one of the toughest issues for the collective bargaining and union process is differential pay. And it's been fairly resisted um, by the unions. You know, um, Where differential pay is fairly standard in the private sector, well, what are your thoughts about differential pay? Well, differential pay, differential tuition, those uh, kinds of things can make sense as long as they are not used by private or public management as reward and punishment. And we're in a period of transition. I think a lot of things that have been resisted, such as the, the pension abuses on uh, overtime, we're moving towards resolution of those things. This crisis will do that. I think it ought to be part of a, uh, an ongoing discussion, but with careful uh, consideration of its potential for abuse. 
I, I would just say uh, I, I do think you need more private sector uh, pay incentives. I, I did not say in this debate, by the way, that I thought teachers uh, were overpaid. Um, I said that uh, benefit levels, especially on health insurance, need to be rationalized so that they're, they're, they have skin in the game, as do state workers, for instance. Uh, but I do think differential pay would be important if you need physics teachers, if you need calculus teachers, uh, and there's a shortage of them, you pay them more. Right now, our system doesn't reflect the fact that we, we need to pay certain, to attract certain people, we need to pay them the, more. The problem is the, the, the mechanisms for measuring who gets the differential pay become extremely controversial and sometimes bizarre. <laughs> Times had a story of, a couple of weeks ago about a young teacher who, because she was involved with a certain kind of student and whose test scores were not therefore going up, was deemed an unsuccessful teacher. Well, everyone knew that wasn't the case. The drive to standardization, we're going to use test scores to somehow justify the pay policies, is crazy. If you're at a school like Scarsdale, where the test scores are good for many reasons, including socio and economic reasons, and you can't show that you've increased them, that would be, in some, by some people's measurement, a sign of being an unsuccessful teacher. So, the, again, the theory makes sense. We've got to find a way to do it in ways that don't give us an irrational. I, I, I actually agree with you. I don't think that uh, uh, tests. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what? I don't fully disagree with you. <laughs> no, I, I don't think test scores alone uh, should be a basis uh, for compensation or evaluating someone's success for the precise reason you said. But there, we've got a system now where we've basically got a least common denominator approach toward evaluation. And we've got to move to something that's more flexible and market oriented and, and reflective of what the true needs are in government and schools. There's a question there, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, Abe. First, I, I think uh, we all need to congratulate the hosts of this program for what should be an ongoing regular format for discussing uh, major issues in the state. It was only a passing comment very early in the discussion. I want to make sure I heard it right. The federal government does not engage in collective bargaining for their employees. Was that correct? <coughs> That's correct by and large for the vast majority true, John. of their not employees. Not true at all. Well, you see, I, I guess we have a third participant. In that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have but, somebody that negotiated collective bargaining when he was a member of a federal union. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, sir. I'm only asking a question. Please don't beat me up. Richard did that for a lot of years. <laughs> the, but if our largest government does not engage in collective bargaining and does not permit strikes for many of their employees, what would be your view? about changing that system. If that were to be true, then they're wrong. What are the facts? But uh, wow. the facts are that there's a, there's a crazy quilt pattern that is not uh, uh, exact in every state or in every uh, federal agency. They, there's no collective bargaining in the military. There is collective bargaining in, 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 the, in, in, in other places, including the post office and places like that. But, but the, it's the principle that ought to be focused on. I believe that it ought to be extended where it is not, and rationalized. They, they, not, I, I am not a defender of the status quo. I want that very clear. I'm not a defender of the status quo tax-wise, or the defender of the status quo spending-wise, or the defender of the status quo in terms of the contours of collective bargaining. But what I am a defender of is the use of that process in American society to resolve economic questions that involve middle-class people. I see no alternative, and to the extent that there's a factual question about the federal government, we should resolve that, th those policies in favor of more collective bargaining. And, the, and, and, and I, I would uh, say, well, Paul, I'll to talk to you about that, because I, I would stand to be corrected if, if I'm wrong, but I think for many public employees in the federal government, the collective bargaining doesn't exist. But I did want to share you a, um, a quote from a, a prominent public official in Wisconsin speaking on this topic, said this sharing of power is in wage determination and conditions of employment through the negotiation process has in turn diminished public officials' authority in other areas of policy involving organized employees. The net effect has been to create what amounts a, to a two-chamber local government. And then he goes on to say the gravity of the challenge was recognized by some municipal officials at least 10 years ago 
but most of them took the position that to study the new phenomenon was to encourage it. As is usually the case, the ostrich stance was a mistake. When employee organizations suddenly burgeoned, municipal officials were not prepared with effective rejoinders before legislatures and in negotiations. That is from Frank Seidler, the Socialist Party mayor of Milwaukee between 1948 and 1960. We have come full circle. <laughs> uh, there's a question here and then there's a question there. <coughs> I know we're uh, getting close to the end, and I, I do want to very much thank our speakers and our wonderful moderator. Um, Richard, you uh, have talked about values uh, several times, and for both of you, I, I guess one way to look at the compensation question is, what is the metric, uh, what is, or if, there are, if there's more than one, what is the most important metric for assessing whether we are compensating public employees uh, properly? Is it comparing to the public sector? Is it... Uh, asking what is the level needed to bring in people who can do the job appropriately? Is it the taxpayer's ability to pay, or is it something else? Well, I think that all of those things, I would say that the, the data used in many cases, and not by John, I, I hastily add, about comparability has been just sheer nonsense. What is the comparable for a cop? What is the comparable for a special <coughs> ed teacher? Uh, the, the, there is, it is a very difficult thing to do. That isn't to say you don't want to be Attempted. It is a relevant factor. I would point out that the attack on comparability from the right has come at a time after they have successfully lowered compensation for the private worker across the state. Union busting um, and an attack on uh, job exports, economic forces beyond anybody's conspiratorial control have seen a diminishment in compensation to the middle class. Now they're saying, after we've succeeded in doing that from the corporate point of view, now we're going to apply that same standard to the public sector. Um, th there is a place for organizations like the Rockefeller Institute and Albany Law School to engage in that question, but the first thing we have to do is eventually get data that we don't manipulate for the purposes of our own particular ends, and I think this debate has suffered, not to this morning, but this debate about uh, public sector compensation has suffered from awful manipulation of the data. Um, I think all those factors should be used, and I, I think that we also need to, again, just because something was enshrined in law 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago, doesn't mean, it's, doesn't mean that it meets the needs and requirements today. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the key for me is providing efficient public services while allowing the private sector economy to grow. Because ultimately, if we don't have a healthy private sector economy that produces wealth and jobs, we're just in a, in a zero-sum game here in this analysis. And uh, our jobs are going to be leaving to other places, here and abroad. Okay. Um, one last question, and I'm going to ask each of the speakers to sum up. It's a question for Mr. Faso, Richard Drucker. Uh, bring it back to Wisconsin. Um, when the bill was introduced, and the one that uh, Governor Walker supports. There were two provisions in the bill. One was, I mean, there were many provisions, but two specifically that I want to talk about. One was the uh, provision that called for the decertification of the union uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and the second was um, for public sector unions. Uh, here in the state, there's agency fee, so everybody pays their fair share. Uh, in Wisconsin, they called for a moving to a system where individuals who were part of the union and derived services and were covered by the collective bargaining agreement would be able to opt out from uh, paying dues to their union. If you were a legislator, or still were a legislator in the state, the bill came before um, New York State legislators, would you support a bill with those two provisions? And if so, how do those two provisions deal with the crux of what you were talking about earlier, which is the economic crisis that the state is facing. No, I, my, my response on that was that those wouldn't be things that I would advocate for in New York. But I do think that you have to realistically look at the existing structure, as I've, I've enunciated here this morning. And the existing structure that we've got, state and local, is simply unaffordable. So I, I don't think that necessarily this should be viewed as, a, as something that would 
uh, require those kind of provisions in New York. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be advocating them, for instance. But I do think we ignore, at our peril, the real cost drivers that are, that are literally bankrupting communities in our state and turning much, many parts of the state into a wasteland unless we change the cost drivers in our economy. Yeah. I think we are now approaching the tail end, so I was going to ask each of the speakers to spend about a minute just summing up. Richard? Well, let me thank Holy Law and uh, uh, <coughs> Rockefeller, uh, Abe, uh, and John. My task was made infinitely more difficult today because in the end, John is much more reasonable than he wants you to know. <laughs> the, 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 I, I raise that because the national debate and even the debate that will occur about these issues outside this room won't be this civil, won't be this intellectually honest, and hopefully, or I, I believe, won't even be this entertaining. Um, the, 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 there is an awful, awful tide of public discourse and debate that has dominated the nation and the state for the last five or 10 years. It is anger-based, and it demonizes opposition views. That didn't happen this morning, and I think that's all to the good. And to the extent that anybody continues with these debates, I just urge you, if there's any lesson from this morning, it is these things can be explored and discussed in, 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 in oppos with opposition camps in ways that illuminate and don't destroy it. But I do think that in the end, New York will not turn the way of Wisconsin. And it will not turn the way of Wisconsin because in the end, the people of the state, even under stress, as they are now, share a set of values about what the workplace should look like, what human rights are, what, are, uh, what the concentration of wealth means to the average citizen that will preserve those things that are valuable and important about collective bargaining and budgeting of the state, uh, and that the politics of the state will eventually follow that. And to the extent that, as a member of the legislature, uh, a term of service that I'm intensely proud of, uh, enabled me to express those views then, I was uh, pleased to do so, and I will continue to do so to the extent I'm ever invited back. Thank you all very much. Well, and uh, I also would like to thank uh, Rockefeller and Albany Law, uh, and also my able and distinguished uh, colleague, Richard Brodsky, who uh, is always illuminating and always entertaining, but uh, always civil, and I thank you for that. Uh, I think that the bottom line that I hope we all consider as we assess the various issues that we face is what kind of state do we want this to be uh, in 30 years? What kind of state will we have going forward? When I grew up uh, on Long Island in the 50s and 60s, my dad was a janitor at the Catholic grammar school where I went to school, and then he was a TV repairman. And my mom worked as a bank teller. And there were plenty of opportunities all around us. New York was a state that had hundred was the headquarters of about 150 Fortune 500 corporations. Today we're almost uh, about 40. Uh, we had uh, 43 or 45 members of the House of Representatives serving our state. After this next redistrict redistricting, we'll have 27. Something is happening that we should not, we ignore at our peril. The people of our state are voting with their feet. They are leaving this state. And I'll leave you with a, another example of two <coughs> folks I met who were about to retire from working for Oswego County when I was campaigning up, up there. And it was a big festival, and then we had a sudden downpour, and we wound up under this enclosure, and we were talking. And I was talking about what they did and what their jobs were and their hopes for their kids. And they were saying to me, well, as soon as we retire, we're moving out of state. And I said, well, why are you doing that? He said, we can't afford the property taxes here in Oswego County. And I'll tell you, you hear these stories from people all over New York State. How can we collectively make this state better? It requires us to reform some of our, our current no notions and our prevailing nostrums as to how we should do government. And if we don't do it, we do it at our peril because it's a competitive world economy out there. And right now, New York is on the losing end of that dynamic. Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you to both speakers.